one of the things I found really interesting yesterday talking to uh, Matt and Kevin, it, it made it more clear to me than I had really realized before I came how universal the problem of designing tests was. Um, and so I, I went home and I went home last night. Okay, wait, I got up really early this morning and Doug uh, made a slide presentation out of like the first 20 pages of chapter 9 of the book. I don't know who has read that book, so it doesn't really matter. You don't need to have done it. What I'm going to do is spend uh, some amount of time, 15 or 20 minutes, talking about principles, and then I'm going to show you some code. The code is going to be about the problem those guys were working on yesterday. It's about what happens in your classes if you don't use dependency injection. The effect that it has on the class, the effect that it has on your tests. And then if you turn around and use dependency injection in your code, that has an effect on your test too that has consequences, and it talks about those consequences and how to deal with them. It also, as a, it's a two-pronged thing. The dealing with dependency injection and dealing with the problem of testing test doubles that you inject goes right to dealing with interfaces and having uh, dynamic languages have interfaces be kind of invisible in a way that makes the code hard to deal with. So first we're just going to talk some. Um, as I said yesterday, the writing good code is a, is needs three skills. If you want apps to be well designed and work, you have to have all of these skills. You have to know something about the principles of design. It's fine with me if you made them up yourself, just like I made up Denver, right? But you have, you have to understand the consequences of your choices about how you arrange code. You have to have tests, because what you're going to want to do is refactor. And you cannot refactor safely unless you have tests. Here's where we get into a situation, though, where tests can, uh, the wrong kind of tests can really cost you money. So, you know, we have this, in the, in the Ruby community, in the Rails community, we have a very strong uh, ethic about writing tests. And it's easy to get sidetracked from the goal to this idea, right? We do, we're not doing it because someone told us we should do it. We're doing it because there's some underlying principle that we want to achieve. And it's, it's, it's interesting now, I find, like, I'm very careful about how I craft code, but I'm a little bit more likely to just fling shit into tests. And so, so like, the way we used to write code is now kind of the way we write tests. Like, they, they don't have as much thought. They don't need as much. They, you know, you don't, I don't worry so much about refactoring all the duplication out of a test. Sometimes I intentionally leave tests so that they're real readable. And so uh, there's, there's a kind of gunslinging fun available in writing tests that we used to have in writing code. And so there's, there's still a place for that. It's just moved back behind this wall. Um, so we say we write tests actually for those three reasons, right? These, these are the justifications we give for writing tests. So they explain what the system does. I can uh, lower the cost of having bugs by uh, identifying those bugs earlier in the process and that the act of writing tests is going to improve my design. I can promise you that if writing tests costs more overall in your app than not writing tests, we wouldn't do it. These are side effects of tests. The, the reason we write tests is because we want to save money. Um, we, we had a talk at dinner last night about happiness. And that talk led me to, to, to send that the, 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 the animate thing out that some of you have watched, where a guy who was talking about work defined what, uh, tried to articulate what made us happy at work. And he said the things that make us happy at work are not money, they're autonomy, purpose and mastery. And, and I find those things are so powerful because they're true. They ring that bell. We want to do our best work. And sometimes people get really pissed about writing tests because they get in a situation where tests seem to be impeding progress, where tests seem to not have, not uh, add enough value to compensate for the cost of writing them. It's easy to do that if you're not careful about what you're doing. So there are two symptoms of things being wrong. The first symptom is that tests are hard to write. The setup is complex, and we saw this yesterday. Right? Like everybody's had this experience. There's a thousand different objects that somehow you have to get. There's a huge network where you have to build up this incredible universe to make your test run. When there's too much context, the problem is a problem of the design of your code. Right? The tests are a victim 
of the design of your code. And so that first symptom, you can't fix that by changing the test design. You have to go back and fix the code design. And that often involves doing some form of breaking things into smaller pieces. Uh, the objects have too much knowledge of other objects. They understand too much about the context that they expect. And so that, that problem, the problem of expensive tests where context is high, forces you to go back to the code. However, there's another way that tests can really cost you money. And, they can, and this can happen even when your design is perfect. You can have perfectly designed code and write expensive, wasteful tests. And so this talk is about that problem. It's about how to write tests that are wrapped around code that's well designed and the ways in which that goes wrong. The core problem, as in every situation, is knowledge. When things know too much about one another, those are dependencies. In, in, the UPI, in the academic UPI terms, they would call that uh, they, when information breaks encapsulation. When I know, as an object, a lot about my surroundings, then that costs me in tests because tests have to know that same set of things. Um, what it means is you can't change any of those external things without breaking your tests. Even if your test doesn't care, it's not about that. So, testing is about messages. Object-oriented design is about messages. And so the first thing we're going to do is uh, put messages in categories and name them so that we can talk about them as separate individual things. In the whole wide world of object-oriented design, there are only three kinds of messages. The ones an object sends to itself, the ones that it receives from the external world, and the ones that it sends back out to the external world. Sorry, I'm having a little... Okay, so here's all you need to know. These are the three categories of messages. Your object under test is like a space capsule that has airlocks. The incoming messages are received from others. Outgoing messages are messages that you send to others. And these are holes that you blast in the containment of your object. Some messages are you only send to yourself. Other people in the system never send those messages in. Every message that your object knows about is in one of these three categories. So you have a choice when you write your test. You can, you're going to assume a point of view. If you stand inside the object under test, as if you can see all of its internals, then you can couple yourself. You can, you can end up testing things that don't matter. And this is particularly true about the sent to self category here. Well, actually, let me back up here. When I, when I deviate from the script, I always get in trouble. So, so you can stand in one of two places. You can stand inside and know everything. And I, saying that word should ring alarm bells. You don't want to know more than you have to. Or you can choose a test point of view that sights along the edges, of the edges of the objects and just watches the messages that come and go. This, when you do that, when you stand outside instead of inside, you, your test becomes much like any other object in your application that's reusing the object that you're testing. You don't know very much. And, and it puts you in that space that I talked about yesterday Design, design, object oriented design is about messages and it happens in the space between objects. And you want your tests to stand in that space that from, from the point of view of what they're trying to think about. Um, just as it ultimately costs you in your objects if you know too much about others, the same thing happens in your tests. You can increase your cost dramatically for no gain by knowing too much. So the absolute best tests are those that prove, they do the minimum amount necessary to prove that your system works without uh, incurring any additional risk by testing things that don't matter. So by definition, a message that only you know and only you send to self is private-ish, private-ish, right? It, I mean, it might not really be private, but if no one's, like, why would you make a method private? Two, I can only think of two reasons, right? One is that you think it's unstable, and you're trying to warn me about it. The other is that you really do want to prevent me from using it. And as we know in Ruby, you can't prevent me. 
And so all it is, it's like, I mean, you could put a comment there, like it just depends on how hard you want to make my life or how strongly you want to issue that warning, whether you would mark code as private or not. I personally never use private. Very good programmers use it all the time. It's a decision that you're probably, you, it, you probably have a convention here at Hashrocket that you should just agree on and follow. Um, I, it, yeah. I mean, I want to know that you think that a message might be unstable. Like in the Rails framework, they're now using their prefixing methods with an underscore, which is their warning to me that says, best of luck, feel free to use it, but we're going we're gonna to change it without warning you. We have no contract to keep to maintain this part of the API. And so, you know, I'm willing to take my chances using your private methods. I appreciate the information you give me about how relatively stable or unstable you think they are. But for messages sent to self in any object, whether you make them private or not, you probably shouldn't test them. Now, there's a whole big thing in the community about whether, like, so now here's a whole class of tests you can just take off the table. I can't see this by citing along the object's boundary, so I'm just going to ignore it in my test. You get complete test coverage by testing all the inputs and all the outputs. Um, there are times, however, when I do break the rule I just told you and I test private methods. I do it when I'm under development and I have some hairy internal private thing and I know that my tests are going to be unstable because I know that the private code is going to change, but I want to get an error message that's close to the source of the error. And, and so even though I could have an incoming message that in, in, eventually fails because of the failure in the private message, I don't want to chase that chain back while I'm actively working on some hairy code. So I routinely have tests of private methods that are temporary until things settle down. And I understand that when I do that, when I write a test of a private method, I'm in that situation where my tests are costly because they're going to break every time my code changes. And I do it deliberately because that cost is cheaper than the cost of chasing down the exact point of the error. Once things stabilize, though, you should probably remove those tests. There's a school of thought that says you should never have a private method, not because you're like me and, it's, and you just don't want to declare it, but that anything that's private ought to get moved to another class. Um, I find that I kind of agree with that point of view, and it's certainly worth thinking about when you get in that situation. However, for things that are unstable, if you made them private because they're unstable, they don't get more stable just because you move them. And so while, you know, the, while everything is still sort of rolling around on the table and you're working on it, it's just as easy for your own personal use to, to put them in your, you know, implement those methods in the class under test. If, if you're the only one that calls them, test them at your peril if, if it's useful. And maybe when things settle down, you can think about moving them to another class if it looks like anybody's ever going to want it. I personally don't mind having stuff that I think of as private that doesn't get extracted in another test. The day will come. Like, if a need, if a need arises, I'll move them. But I rarely move that stuff proactively. Your mileage may vary. So, no one cares. If it can't be seen, by citing along the boundaries of your object, ignore those methods. Ultimately, in your production delivered app, you're done. Those tests will cost you money. Um, so the next kind of message, message number two, is incoming. These are messages that are declared in the public interface of the receiving object. Imagine they have a class, a wheel class, bicycle wheel, represents bicycle wheel, and it has a method in it called diameter. It implements diameter. That's part of the public interface of wheel. It is wheel's test's job to make, it is wheel is responsible, the receiving object is responsible for all tests of state. These are where you're going to make assertions about, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the click thing. Okay, so making assertions about return values, this, this is the, in our spec, you know, it should equal something. These tests are tests of state, and they belong in the, in the class of the, in the test for the receiving object. There's nowhere else where you can ever make an assertion about state for a method. This, the, it's, it's really important that you can find those tests to the class that implements the method in the receiver side. And this is where people fall into a trap. And I saw this code yesterday. I've done it a million times myself. It's really, really easy for well-intentioned people who want to have good test coverage 
to, to make assertions about state for outgoing messages. Not in, the, not in your wheel test where, where wheel implements diameter. You've got some other class like gear that sends a message to wheel where it sends the diameter message to wheel. And, and people will put tests of state over there too. These are duplications. And when you change the, the when you change the receiving class wheel to do a, to do a dip, different implementation, you're going to have to go chase down all those other tests that are making assertions about wheel and change their assertions of state. Those tests are completely unnecessary, and if you have them, you should delete them. They add no value. Um, the reason they add no value is this distinction between outgoing and incoming. My outgoing is your incoming. Every place there's an outgoing message, you do not have to test the state because by definition, that's an incoming message somewhere else. If foo sends baz to bar, the tests of state belong in bar, not in foo. So every time you look at, your, every time you look at a class under test, you're making assertions about state for incoming, but you could care less about the outgoing messages here. Now, this doesn't mean you don't need to test outgoing messages. It's just that you don't test them for state. There are two kinds of outgoing messages, and one of them you need to have tests for. There's queries, and there's commands. You can probably guess that queries are messages that you send to others that have no side effects. Right? If gear sends diameter to wheel, gear cares about the answer that gets back, but nothing in your app breaks if that doesn't happen. You can ignore that message. No one knows or cares. It does not matter. Gear has some, gear has some incoming tests that you, you're making assertions about state for. If something in the chain of what it does breaks because somebody else breaks, you will get a failure in your app. And so, and so there's no reason to make any kind of assertion about a query message. Well, what if the state of gear depends on the result of that query message. Um, you can sit, you can, it is, we'll get to that a little bit. The, the issue is, it very often you need to pass something back or your test won't run. Pass it back, but don't make assertions about it. Okay. Right? And, and there's a place there, there is a place there where you can introduce brittleness. It's absolutely true. But still, you know, it, there's two levels of brittleness. One is that you pass something back. The second one is you actually test the return value. Now, it does also, sometimes you just want your test to break because you're afraid you're going to get brittle. But every one of those things increases your cost, right? Every layer is an additional layer that someone's going to have to deal with later. So the other kind of outgoing message is called a command message. And these are messages that do have side effects. Your app is not going to work unless these things run. This is it wrote to a database. It created a file. It changed the state of some other object. Every receiver. Every receiver of those messages is already testing state, right? You don't have to test state. And very often, uh, command messages that you send don't return any state. I mean, maybe they throw an exception, right? If you tell Active Record to save something, it might blow up. But you, there's nothing that comes back, usually, that you rely on. It's very common in those cases. You don't even look or need the result. However, your if your test doesn't send that message, the app is going to fail in some other way. This is where you set expectations on mocks. Expectations, mocks test, the expectations are tests of behavior, not state. And so I'm saying I expect that I will send you this message. And that is the sum total of the test. It may well be that you have to return a value from the mock in order to get your test to continue running. But that value it, it serves no purpose other than to let your test run. You are not checking it. And, and, and you know, if you see, it's easy to look at a test code where people set up mocks and they set ex expectations on those mocks that return values, and then they check those return values in their tests. Okay, that serves no purpose. That that return value was in your mock. Like there's no there's nothing in your application that had anything to do with that, and so it's doubly wrong. I have a test that's going to break, and the mock proves nothing about the return value. So. All you have to do is prove that you sent the message. And the temptation here is very strong to, to look at the result and make assertions about the result. But the receiver of the message has every test of state that's necessary. 
And you will duplicate that code if you test it on the outgoing side of this equation. So the general rules here are that for incoming messages, make assertions about state. Outgoing query messages, just ignore them. Outgoing command messages, use mocks and set expectations on behavior. You want to write the fewest number of tests. You never want to write one extra test. And you want to test stable things. You want to, you want to cite along the bounds of objects and test the public API. Not only do you want to test stable things, but you want to test them once, just one time. And this will allow you to save money, which should make you happy. Okay, so let's look at some code. This code is going to reveal that I am still a text me user. Dun, dun, dun. And I'm going to make it really, 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 really big. Okay, so assume that we have these two classes. There's a wheel class, and it knows how to, it takes a rim and a tire, so it's a bike wheel, and it can calculate diameter. There's also a gear class that, this looks a lot like these, the first example that we worked on yesterday. It can take two arguments for rim and tire, and it hard-coded deep inside a method in this class is a reference to the wheel class. So there are a couple of problems with this. So, so this does not use dependency injection. Why is this bad? Well, I mean, some people, so often people answer that question by saying, well, what if wheel changes its name? And I'm just like, well, who cares? I mean, you have a text editor. It's easy enough to find every place you say wheel and change it to something else, right? Like, it's not, the problem here is not that wheel might change its name. The problem here is that gear thinks the universe is made of things. The gear firmly believes that it is only willing to calculate gear inches for instances of wheel. Gear, and gear doesn't really care. If you look at this code, gear, gear does not really care at all. Gear, gear could, gear is capable of calculating gear inches for anything that has a diameter. But you have prevented that in this code because you stuck, you glued gear, well, frankly, I glued gear to wheel, right? And so I, there's a whole body of things that gear is willing to do for anything that, me, that, that um, implements the diameterizable role. And I've prevented that right off the bat by embedding this class name in here. It's just really bad. There's, there's absolutely no reason to do this. It is just as easy well, okay, so actually let me, let me proceed actually with my script. So, so, so I've got these two classes. Now I'm using test unit, uh, mini test, which I'll bet none of you use. This, these are the examples I took right from the book, and I use mini test because it's now bundled with Rails with uh, Ruby 1.9. And so anybody who buys this code can just run all, they can run these tests in the book without doing anything. It, it, since you guys all write tests, you ought to be able to parse this pretty quickly, right? It's, this, it's the simplest flavor of testing known to humankind. <coughs> It looks a lot of like the old test unit test. Um, so if you want to test a wheel, it's really easy. You just get a new wheel and you give it some things and you know, you can assert something about it, right? And testing a gear, so here's the gear test. Now it's secretly, deep in gear, it gets a wheel. But I can't tell it from looking at the test. I don't know, right? There's a coupling that's invisible because I didn't inject the dependency. I can, I, you, as you can guess from looking at the code, wheel's really fast. So this doesn't matter. But we want, there's a lot of situations that you can get in that drive you to want to not be coupled to wheel in this test. Maybe it's an external interface. Maybe it's slow. Maybe you don't own it. Right? It goes on and on. There's, it, there's a lot of ways in which you might want to be uh, not tied to an actual instance of the wheel class here. But because I didn't inject the dependency, it's a real pain in the ass to get wheel out of there. It is really hard. It, like what, I don't even know, I didn't even try to do it on this test because in the example code, way back in like chapter three, we 
fix this problem right away. All right, so let's just move forward to the next example. Now here's an example. I've changed gear. Gear used to take a rim and a a rim and a tire here, a tire size, and now it just gets this object wheel. And so from gear's point of view, not much has changed, and it asks that wheel for a diameter. Now I called it wheel, and I injected it right. I injected the arguments uh, at initialization time. I call it wheel, but I can promise you, I do not think of it as an instance of the wheel class. This change, when you start injecting dependencies, you should immediately start thinking of those things as playing roles. And so this, this the thing that I injected, uh, I'm going to call a diameterizable. It plays that role. And, and to play that role, all it does is it has to implement this API. It has to be able to answer the diameter message. Now, when you do that, I have a problem with the test. So now my gear test, which used to not even know about wheel, it didn't expose any attachment to the wheel class, now I have to inject something that plays that role, that's a diameterizable. And it's really very simple to choose. Like in my app right now, one object plays that role, wheel. And so I can just move the, the hard-coded class name out into the test create a new instance of it, and inject it. And frankly, very often, that is as far as you need to go at this point. This, and, and there's a thing that has, um, like, there, there, you don't have any more. Now, you know, we're getting into the speculation range here. Do, might I have more? Might I have lots? Why am I doing this, right? What I want to do is expose the dependency and preemptively do the decoupling. But uh, it, with the code, with this code, as simple as it is, I would definitely stop in a real life application at this point. But so, but let's um, let's move on. Let's assume I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to assume there are 50 diameterable diam diameterizables. I've got tons of classes that can play this role, and they all cost varying amounts of too expensive stuff. I want to remove it out of my test. The other thing is I want to make it really clear to people that this role exists. Because it doesn't, it's not necessarily obvious in the code. I could have lots of objects that had different names that implemented diameterizable, and you better get one at runtime. And so I, I have a, it's a real priority for me to not only use roles, but to make it really visible via the test that roles exist. So in this case, I'm going to make a test double. So I'm going to create a test double. Instead of injecting wheel, I'm going to inject this guy. Now, uh, mini test is a low ceremony framework, and I could have done a double stubbing, whatever, but it's just as easy to make a plain old Ruby object here and do it. So the double serves a couple of purposes, right? It exposes the role. But it also lets me, it, like doubles, when you make a test double and you stub in a method, it's like creating an artist's sketch. And you know, sometimes, like bird books do this. If, you, if anybody in here is a birder, like lots of bird books don't have pictures of birds in them. They have drawings. And the reason they have drawings is the drawings like let all the confusing detail drop away, and they show you the piece that matters right now. And so this double is a sketch of a diameterizable that emphasizes just one point. It's like a little Picasso drawing where you can see that one thing. And what it tells you is that the diameter is 10. And that is like dumb as a rock, and it's perfect for my test. I really want that rely. I want to depend. I want to expose to the person who's reading the test, and I, the the simplest thing possible. The fact that this is very simple is a feature, and and it's a real quality that you can use in your test to to uh, convey your intentions to people who come along behind you and try to read them and figure out what's going on. So here I have made a double, and I implement. Sorry. You guys, I'm sure that you know that the, the crosshair pointer is incredibly small here. So I'm going to inject it in the test. So what's not to like? This seems perfect, right? Like I, now I have dependency injection, and I made a double, and so now maybe wheel's are really slow, but now my test is really fast all the time because I've injected this double, and the, the double is completely intention revealing about it, what, what it does. What could possibly go wrong? Well, actually, and I'll go back one more. I'm going to go one more step, step further to expose the role. I'm going to go back in wheel in the other test, and I'm going to say that it implements this role. This is a diameterizable. But it turns out that 
I'm going to just change something in the app. I'm going to go into wheel. This method, I'm going to change the API of the role. It used to say diameterize, well, I'm going to change it to width. And I'm going to forget to fix the send in gear. All right, so the, the API of the role has changed, but the user of the role is sending the wrong message now. My app is clearly broken. It's absolutely broken. And so here's the thing about if you inject real objects. If you inject a wheel, if you're using, if your tests use the apps, if your tests use the object that your application use, your tests always fail as they should. They might be slow, but they fail. And you, you can't really overestimate the value of your test breaking when your app is broken. This is a really good thing, all right? Um, however, if I take that same code, if I make that same change in this test where I'm using my double, here's what happens. My double, I'm going to back this up a little bit. Notice that the double still implements diameter. Wheels, when I, wheel implements gear. I changed one player of the role, but not another. When I introduce the test double, my app suddenly has two players of the role. One of them is used in production. One of them is used only in the test. But, you know, we um, object-oriented design tells you to do dependency injection be because it thinks that the object that you want to inject will change more often than the API of that object. Right? That's why dependency injection works. It thinks uh, object-oriented design places a bet. It says, you're going to want another kind of diameterizable instead of changing the name of that method. And what we just did here is we like did the thing that will make us lose that bet. I didn't, it is not, it is still okay to inject a wheel, but it's not okay to send it that message. I changed the API of the role. And this is what causes people to say that mocking and stubbing make your test brittle. It's this problem. And, and so if you were going to do this chain of things, if you're gonna inject dependency so that you can let gear work with anybody, and you're going to create test doubles so that your tests reveal the role and are fast no matter what, then you have created a problem for you that it is possible for your test doubles to, to get out of alignment with the actual behavior of the role so that your tests cheerily report that everything is fine and your production app breaks. And there's a solution for that, and it, it, it rests on this transition that we're making between thinking of these objects as instances of their classes. The so we're transitioning to thinking of these objects as players of a role. Um, so here's a, when I, earlier I showed you this actually, and we're gonna look at it again here. So, so this is the method that I put back in wheel to try to say, oh, it's playing this role. But you could, it turns out, we know that wheel is not the only player of this role. I want to share that test. And you can share it in, in testing, in mini test, you just make a module, and this, this would be the RSpec thing where you made a shared example group, right, and said it should behave like. So if I were to, to, to make a test to prove that wheel played the role, I could then isolate that role test, and I can inject that test, I can include that test right back in wheel, so, so wheel still works. But now, now I have this magic. I can go in the gear test and add a bit. I can test my double and prove it, prove it still plays the role. And so now I have every bit of goodness. I can, inject the, I can inject the object instead of knowing the class name. I can inject any kind of object. Gear can collaborate with anybody that knows how to do diameter. I can use these sketches, these test double sketches in my tests to be really intentionally revealing, and I can be confident that they will never accidentally go out of date and break my code in a way that's deceiving. If you run this test, right now what happens is it fails. It's, it still tells you that it's, it's passing, but now you know that your double is out of date. And that failure will drive you to fix this piece of code, to change, the, change your double to implement width, and then when you do that, the app starts failing. 
and it's easy enough. Right now you know exactly where to go to fix it, and then when you fix it, when you get all the doubles in alignment with the actual API, you end up with two tests that pass. And so dependency injection is a powerful thing, and it will make, I, I, if um, Matt and I had a little conversation this morning about whether it really was useful to do, for them to do what, what we were talking about doing yesterday with dependency injection, and he said a really interesting thing. He was like, oh, we didn't get anything done yesterday, but it's going to be a lot easier to make changes tomorrow. And my first response is like, I so wish we could measure that, all right? But I think those guys will tell you that, that following this path, like at first it's like, it's like any technical skill, and now we're talking just particularly about dependency injection. It looks a little odd, and it seems, it's not, if it's not what you're doing now, it's hard to get used to it, and it feels like it costs money when you start doing it. But it doesn't take very long before you find the places where it'll save you money, and you learn to sidestep the potential pitfalls downstream. And, and so now you have tests that are always going to pass or fail when they should, and you have a gear class that can collaborate with anything that has a diameter. So, voila. There you go. Questions? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry I talked so long. I didn't really know it was going to happen. You don't have to have questions. I could just eat my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> So let it settle, and if you have if questions come to you later, come get me. <laughs>